This is maybe small, but it's really fast. Want to customize your Windows 10 desktop wallpaper and look as you please and also get rid of that annoying watermark in the right bottom corner of your screen? Visit GoodOffer24 and use my promo code TACTIC for a discounted genuine Windows 10 license and activate your Windows today for good with a cheaper offer. Let's connect this thing back. Hi guys, Matthew here and welcome back again to my channel. Just recently I was going through some of the fast external drive options for my test rig, which got me thinking to revisit one of my older videos, but with a little bit of a twist with using this external NVMe M.2 SSD. This type of fast external drive solution can be a really handy add-on for users who are for example switching between their PC and laptop and want to have a portable game library which can be moved back and forward between these two devices as needed. Let's say one of them or even both are not big enough for your needs as nowadays games can get enormously big <coughs> in Call of Duty so something like this can be a good alternative in that case so you don't end up wasting any space on the devices themselves or you just want to have that level of flexibility at your disposal. In my case, since I tend to do a lot of hardware testing and troubleshooting, I sometimes need an easy and basically instant way of being able to boot the system up and start working right away without messing with drives, installations and so on, which is why I've decided to make a portable Windows 10 drive with everything already installed and ready to go with using one of these as my daily companion. Anyhow, there's a couple of routes you can take. You can get an already built up and pre-assembled external SSD or you can buy an external chassis plus an SSD itself separately and just put them together yourself. In that case, in terms of the external chassis formats, you can either go for a 2.5 inch drive enclosure and put a standard 2.5 inch SATA SSD in it, or you can go for an M.2 format type of external enclosure, like one I have here, and put an M.2 SSD module in it. Within the M.2 SSD drives, we have two basic categories when we talk about standards, protocol standards and interface standards. They can then be summed up in two product categories, which are most commonly used when it comes to M.2 SSDs. One are models using the NVMe protocol standard in combination with PCI Express interface, and the other are models using the AHCI protocol standard in combination with SATA interface. In practice, the SATA-based M.2 SSDs have write and read speeds of around 600 megabytes per second at most, since the SATA 3 interface has bandwidth limitation of 6 gigabit per second, although the flash chips and controller could maybe offer even greater speeds. These are often cheaper and good for storage use, as well as for system builds for not that demanding users. On the other hand, the PCI Express-based NVMe M.2 SSDs can be far more expensive, but much faster and nowadays can offer speeds which sometimes even boggle my mind. Although it's not that important if we talk about putting an M.2 SSD on a motherboard, because most of them support both of these product categories, in the context of external M.2 SSD enclosures, the situation can be a little bit tricky, so it's good to pay attention. For example, this is Silverstone's MS-11 external enclosure model, which is not to be confused with their MS-09 or MS-10 models. The reason why I've pointed this out is because the MS-10 and MS-09 only support SATA interface-based M.2 SSDs. On the other hand, the MS-11 which I have here supports NVMe M.2 SSDs, meaning you can use a really fast M.2 drive module based on this protocol and up to 80mm long. Granted, you won't be flying past the 10 gigabit per second mark since this enclosure supports USB 3.1 Gen 2 standard over its Type-C connector, or as they now call it, USB 3.2 Gen 2 standard, so you'll be limited to around 1.2 gigabytes per second of read and write speeds. This is kind of, let's say, inconvenient because today's NVMe M.2 SSDs go far beyond those speeds, so you won't be able to use it to its full extent in this format. The next step in this case would be Thunderbolt 3 or the future USB 4.0 standard. Also, it's important to point out that SATA-based M.2 SSDs use both the M and B key edge connector, or just the B key in some cases, while the M.2 NVMe SSDs use only the M key edge connector. The installation of the M.2 module in the MS-11 was fairly simple, as it usually is with any of the external drive enclosures. This gorgeously crafted chunk of aluminum housing looks to be completely sealed off at first glance, but all you need to do is to pull the metal covers on both ends, pull the PCB out, install the M.2 drive, 
put the thermal pad on it, which you will get from the bundle. And that's it. As simple as that. A bit more complicated than putting it on a motherboard. Although I guess that can also be as complicated as this, as on most of the better equipped ones, you have those metal covers and sometimes even dedicated enclosures. Oh yeah, you will also get this teeny tiny screwdriver, which was useless. With Silverstone's MS11, you'll get a short Type A to Type C cable, as well as a Type A to Type C adapter in case you have a Type C to Type C connection. So you can then just plug the drive in and you're good to go. Since I put an M.2 drive in it that was used on my AMD test rig, it already had everything installed, so I went in to check if that would work right off the bat. Would I be able to boot from it from the first go? Well, it sort of worked. It would just crash upon trying to boot up, and eventually I would get to the recovery screen and I could actually enter the safe mode, but I couldn't boot into it regularly. I've tried a few common fixes for this problem, but nothing worked, I would get IO errors, which was not a big deal since I was planning to put a fresh install anyway. Because the PC reads this drive as a regular M.2 NVMe SSD, you can just easily install Windows onto it using Rufus Software Utility and its Windows to Go image option, you can either mount your own ISO or let the software do the downloading for you, you can even choose which version. Just be sure to put a check mark on the list USB hard drives option so it shows your external USB drives and use the MBR partition scheme in case you cannot finish your installation process with the GPT partition scheme. Once you're done with that, you're pretty much ready to use the drive. You can plug it into a PC that you want to boot it from and use it. In case you're having trouble booting, double check in BIOS that boot devices are set to the right ones. Once you are in Windows, the last step is of course to activate the Windows 10 installation that was just done. And here is where I had a little help from guys at goodoffer24.com in making this content, which are also sponsoring this video. They offer genuine Windows 10 Pro keys, which is where I got my key for this build. And if you're doing something similar to this, or you're in search for a Windows 10 license for yourself, your PC or laptop, you can get yours with a discount using my promo code tactic and pick it up for even lower price. You can get to it in few steps as they also offer PayPal among other payment methods, so you can have your key delivered in very short time, which was my personal experience with them. After you receive the key, the only thing you need to do is to copy it and paste it in Windows activation section found under system and security settings, and that's it, your Windows license is now activated. Of course, if you come across on any problem, feel free to contact their support directly for assistance. With this done, well, you're basically good to go. As for me, I went in to install my usual set of benchmarking and monitoring tools and some games. I have also did a few passive benchmarking runs and checked the booting time just to see if everything was in line with what I would experience with the M.2 drive being put directly onto the motherboard. And to my surprise, it all checks out. I didn't experience any obvious performance difference. Although granted, when I've benchmarked the drive itself, I saw read and write speeds well below the ones specified by the manufacturer, but that was expected due to USB interface limitations. As you've probably noticed, I've also tried using this drive setup on my Z490 chipset-based ITX motherboard, and this marks my start of doing some further extensive testing of this kind of setup, because it is known to be unstable sometimes, so I need to dial everything in and be sure it's sustainable long term. Be sure to subscribe because I'm going to do a build with that system in a very interesting Streetcom DA2 chassis. Either way, you're going to get a really fast external drive for your boot drive, game library or just a storage device. That's it for this time for me. Thank you once again for watching. Please take a second to toss me a thumbs up if you enjoyed my content. That really helps a lot. And if you like what you saw, feel free to subscribe. And if you already are, be sure to press that notification bell down below so you don't miss out on a new video. And until then, catch you later, guys.